So basically, uh, how are you guys doing uh, post Flashpoint? And you know, what's next? Um, no, we're sort of in between stuff right now. We uh... Well, post Flashpoint led like that segment well, that led directly to X, into X, X Company. Company, which was right. a World War II show. So that kept us busy for about five years and uh... longer than the war. <laughs> yeah, almost as long as the war, right? <laughs> Depends if you're an American or not. <laughs> um, and then we uh, then we went and we developed uh, um, a show around the rise of the far right extremists. Interesting. And, and uh, we pitched that a bunch in the States and um, we got a lot of sort of, this was about two years ago. And so we got a lot of incredulous looks like that's not a thing. <laughs> what happened? And then it turned out to be a bit of a thing. So, um, and then we did uh, we did a bunch of time developing the second season of a show called Transplant, which is uh, on CTV and uh, NBC, which is a medical medical show about a Syrian refugee who uh, gets a job as resident in a Toronto hospital. And now we're just uh, cooling our heels and uh, maybe looking at the project to develop. But so yeah. waiting till COVID's over with. Well, well, you can develop even during COVID. It's yeah. one of the few things you can do. Writers are actually at liberty to to gather virtually and to have meetings and to develop projects. And it actually doesn't make as massive a difference to writers as it does to other people at the different stages of production. So it's well, it's not I've as that the production companies have, are back to work, but I know there was, a, you know, a sort of a forced hiatus there for them for a while. It must they must have been hurting. That's right. Yeah, we were working on on transplant as we said, and and that um, the shoot dates for that got pushed multiple multiple times. And between that and other kind of COVID influences, you know, we we had to finally say, okay, well, we've been along for the ride so far, but we can't can't just keep going. Um, but they're they're finally shooting now. I think they're probably starting to shoot their third or fourth episode somewhere in there. Um, but I think they had predicted that they'd be done post production and everything by now. Right. So well, I find it interesting that you guys, uh, uh, anytime there's been a dip, uh, you know, in your particular endeavor, you've always found an opportunity there, and and that's really how Flashpoint got developed. There was a writer strike, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Well, yeah, the writer's strike uh, kicked in by the time a fair amount of development had happened already um, on our end, at the, on the Canadian side. Yeah. Um, and so we were ready to look for American partners. And at that point, the pilot had already been shot. There was already a master plan for the first season, like a lot. It wasn't the writer's strike that uh, prepared us to be, uh, right. to start to gather our ideas. The writer's strike landed exactly at the time when Americans were a little bit more open than usual to considering uh, products that originated in in Canada. Right. Well, it worked out well. I, I mean, that's uh, some of my, you know, best memories was working uh, with you guys on Flashpoint. Yeah, ours too. Ours too. But what do you think that the, people always ask me, like, what what was the difference between you know, Flashpoint and other cop shows that are out there. What do you think hooked people and made them so dedicated watchers? I think our portrait of what it was like to work in a unit like that was a lot more, a lot more three dimensional and embraced uh, the cost, the human cost of being a hero of that of that kind. Um, these cops in our story were not people who. Um, went in there and kicked down doors and left a body count. Every death was taken very seriously, every every risk um, and every person on the other end of the of that barricade was a human being in crisis as opposed to a bad guy who needs to get what's coming. So I think it was it was a very different point of view to approach um, tactical situations from that than you usually see in entertainment. Is that um, and I don't think it was any less exciting for that reason. I think it was a more humanistic and a more um, compassionate portrait of what it's like to be on both sides of the law. 
so again what is that a uniquely canadian perspective or or is uh compassion excitement to a canadian viewer well i think it was um it was inspired by a canadian viewpoint right and and, and you know jimmy like the the original uh, concept for the show was inspired by the hostage taking at union station and yes. the, the, uh, the, the etf uh, negotiated and and eventually lethal force had to be used and and so our approach into that had been how unusual it was for us to see an incident like that unfolding in Toronto, in Canada. It felt like a, a movie. It felt, um, it felt almost not real. Mm -hmm. And it was, and it was that feeling that led us to think, I guess, probably about half an hour after the incident um, had had met its uh, its conclusion, that that our mind had turned to what was the rest of the day like for. The police officer who'd had to take that shot and uh, and i don't think a lot of people really turned their minds that way but it struck us that you've essentially been asked to you know become an executioner and your day is just beginning what's the rest of the day going to be like and and how does that unfold for you and and surely that that can't be easy and 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 so we had uh, you know we hadn't watched that and said that'd be a great TV show, but it was only in relating the story to somebody else that they said, well, you know, that's really interesting. No one's really, you know, put it that way. And would you be interested in maybe pitching that and developing it as a movie of the week, maybe, um, which we did. And it was only during that and then being complete neophytes, really, as writers, we'd only done a couple of short films before we had a background as as actors. We sort of we didn't know where to start, and so we essentially we uh, consulted with uh, Constable Google, and 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 looked up you know Canadian uh, incidents and SWAT, and and we got lucky enough to run across Barney McNeely, uh, who had who had been of course with the ETF and and had left and was heading up a Canadian critical incident, and uh, and was very well connected and. He agreed to meet with us in the lobby of his apartment building, I think quite ready to blow us off. And when he heard that we were interested in what what the the what the day was like for that for that officer, he said, well, I kind of like that you're thinking in, 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 in that way. And maybe I'll put you in touch with 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 that officer. And and so we did get to, to talk to uh, to him and and to spend a little bit of time with an ETF uh, team uh, one night. Um, on the QT and started to learn a few things. And, and I think that our line of questioning surprised officers a little bit and, 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 and probably surprised you, Jimmy, because I was, I always remember the first day that we met you where I met you, which was on the set of the uh, pilot episode. And I had ridden, I think I'd ridden my bike to set or something. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of walked into this big downtown uh, square and there's like all these people around and there's all these ETF cops around. And I'm like, wow, what are they all doing here? I'm like, right, they're background actors. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, I met this other guy a little while later who kind of sidled up to me and we began a conversation and, and it was and it was you and you're wearing your normal clothes, Jimmy. And, and, uh, and you started to speak with me very candidly about some of your experiences being uh, an ETF officer, and, and I guess we were at a unique uh, crossroads for you in your life, and that began several conversations that we had that made us really want to uh, dive into the theme of this series uh, whole, whole, wholeheartedly, you know, of this human cost of heroism. And I don't think we really knew that was what the show was going to be about before we met you, but it was uh, it was through that that friendship and. Mm -hmm. And and over the next few months that we we realized that was the core and that that was what appealed to people that watched the show is that they were able to see behind the uniforms a little bit that they watched a group of people that were professionals that were trained to use lethal non lethal weapons and use them when they had to. Um, but they used them as weapons of last resort and um, and they knew they weren't some of them better than others knew they weren't immune from having been called upon to use those weapons. So uh, de-escalation, crisis resolution is, is a hot button topic now. So it, it, do you think a Flashpoint was a, was a uh, is it life imitating art, art imitating life? <laughs> Certainly, you know, that message was, you know, front and center in, in that show. 
and, and now we see, uh, you know, the public, the media calling on crisis resolution as a starting point. Yeah. Well, we were. Um... Sorry, I shouldn't monopolize stuff, but I, I just, just because just it's on my mind, um, you know, we were, uh, we were very aware of, of the um, Canadian record of use of force versus the US record when we started uh, researching the show. And uh, we knew that the approach of the ETF was a little different than, <clears throat> than those of conventional SWAT teams mm -hmm. in that they, the training was different and they weren't as um, subservient to somebody telling them to just go in and be the muscle. They were trained in human behavior assessment and psychological profiling to a degree. And um, when we were dealing with our American broadcaster, we would get notes very often, which were, you know, why doesn't he just shoot the guy? <laughs> <laughs> and we, it was a very frustrating question. Fortunately, we could always point them and steer them towards the authenticity of of where this story had had been inspired by and but at the time you had shows about forensic scientists that were running around with guns and and shooting people as well so their their fiction was very different from our fiction our reality was different from their reality and i think that if flashpoint had had hit the airwaves now rather than then perhaps uh perhaps uh, perhaps we would seem even more aspirational than, than fictional, uh, you know, and I, and I hope that, uh, you know, policing continues to evolve in the, in the directions that, that Canadian um, enforcement has started to take things. Do you think that we're so exposed to American media, American cop shows, uh, you know, news that, uh, really what Canadian law enforcement goes through is kind of unknown for the most part? I think it's a lot less familiar as a paradigm than the getting there and kick butt is. We're, I think, overall a lot less um, militarized as a society than the Americans are, a lot less ready to equip our, our police force, our law enforcement with, you know, it, it, kind of equipment you would expect to see out in out in the field in a conflict uh, between actual enemy and 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 home as opposed to human beings in crisis and people who are there to maintain the order. I think the Canadian model that we were that had so much inspired us from our conversations with the, the ETF um, is something that we were really proud to put on the world stage that this is a model of understanding that this is not the enemy this is um it's a victory if force is not used it's a victory if words can find a way to let everyone put their weapons down i think in the course of 75 episodes we could probably count on two hands the number of lives that were taken i think we've become very desensitized life is cheap <laughs> um in a lot of action-oriented shows and we wanted to take a really strong stand against that life is not cheap it's uh, it's precious mm -hmm. life, and, and, yeah. that, and that mental illness plays a big role in in policing as well that, that people don't realize or, that. or the people that we... on both sides right <laughs> but uh, but i but i mean you know in, on television and in films you just you're seeing cut out cut out bad guys a lot of the time and 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 not not so often the people that that are that are dealing with lives that have been uh unfairly dealt to them that have struggled with addictions um illnesses you know not getting access to the proper treatments that that and the dealing with those kinds of cases is is difficult and requires a certain kind of um discipline and policing i suppose but that those encounters you know as often as encounter i mean encounters don't always end well either and that there has to be a code and a set of rules and you know we in our show we tried to you know create a situation where you know a, a um a, a a young woman that you were rooting for you know did the wrong thing and she turned her her weapon the wrong way and then they had to they had to take a shot because you have to follow the rules and there has to be a framework and and that creates mental um stigma professional stigma for professionals that work in law enforcement that's very hard to overcome on a on a career and on a personal level and so you know 
I think that those stories need telling and they're not told often enough uh, in film and TV either. Well, I, you know, clearly I'm, I'm biased, but I think you guys did a tremendous job, uh, you know, portraying that and getting that message out there. Uh, for me, again, I obviously, you know, law enforcement's my, my life. Uh, with that said, I find that there's really, uh, you just sort of get talking to people and there's such a, a disconnect about what Canadian police are about and what American police are about. We're, we're it's common language, different cultures. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, they're just, uh, you know, again, bias. There's just not enough shows that uh, portray, you know, what, what happens here in Canada because it is different. And, and again, arguably, uh, we probably deal with more uh, individuals that are suffering from mental illness or emotionally disturbed, uh, yeah. including officers, uh, that uh, it, it just seems to go by the wayside. It's not acknowledged as, as much as, you know, as, as many contacts as we make with people and, and do have to resolve crises. Yeah, I think the the authentic qualities of the show that we were that we valued so much, I think we would probably have not been able to hit that target if we didn't have uh, people like yourself who were able to speak so candidly about the kind of things that are that I think men in general, but also just law enforcement officers are trained to not speak so freely about vulnerability or about indecision or about regret. Um, beating yourself up after a, a decision that you, in a split second, were not able to reconcile yourself with after. Um, I think we, we owe that a great deal to, to you and to some other people who were able to speak um, as, as humans to us um, from what their experience had been. And we were hungry for that. We were absorbing that because as storytellers, that's the kind of conflict that we never get to hear, we never get to share with an audience. I think that was probably one of the reasons people's uh, people responded so positively to to the show while it was running and still now years later. Yeah, yeah. and we were lucky enough to have actors that it really spoke to, mm. right? I think Hugh had Hugh had been through his own yep. uh, struggles as as a human being, and 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 and, and Enrico, who played uh, Sergeant Parker, you know, who's the lead negotiator. He has a brother who's a police officer, so he's he's seen a lot of things up close too. Well, I, I'll I'll close with this. It's a it's a it's a two way street, and as much as perhaps I've done for you, you you did more for me because it it really uh, helped me get back on my feet, and it, you know uh, it, it was nice to be around people that that weren't cops twenty four seven. You know, because sometimes <laughs> we forget. Uh, you know, there's a lot of good people out there. In my opinion, cops hang out with cops because we support each other's insecurity. And probably the best thing you can do is, is get away from those people for a little bit of time anyways to see that there's a lot of good out in the world. So thank you. Well, I think that it goes both ways. And, you know, we not only got to mine your experiences and your heart, but I mean, just your I just there's so many things that that you know I, I can remember one coffee that we sat down with together. I think we met at Sherway years ago, and uh, and I wrote down so many things that you said. But one thing that you said, which I guess is almost cliched and and and, and universal to um, to first responders that have gone through um, through tough calls and tough years, is this is this uh, impulse to put your skeletons into a closet and to shut the door and not let them come out and to, and if, and if it feels like the closet is getting full, you just lean against the door and keep pushing right. against it harder. And putting more in a lot of time. And, doing that. and I think to, to some degree, you know, we all do a bit of that and, and first responders these days is, is widening to include emergency doctors and, and nurses and people that are on the front lines there that are witness to, to very difficult things as well, but that really stuck with me. And I think that uh, I've thought of that often in my life that we all need to open ourselves a little bit more to the people around us, not only as family members, but also professionally so that we can all know that we're in the same boat together and we can all navigate this life that we have better together. And I, I, I really thank you for that enduring lesson. Oh, well, 
My, my again, my pleasure. You're both very sweet. And <laughs> once we once we uh, get through uh, COVID, I'd love to have you in the studio here so we could talk more about again uh, old times, new times, and what's in the future. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I love that. yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. You guys be well. Okay. Thank you, you too, Jimmy. Bye bye. Bye. Bye.